All right. So uh, how is everybody today? Hopefully uh, you're having good weather today, not bad weather today. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Alison Boyer, director of the uh, CTL here at Collin College. If uh, you don't already know me, though I think a lot of you already do. Uh, and I hope you're excited to talk about empathy and emotional intelligence in the classroom today. Um, uh, this is a topic that has always been really interesting to me uh, and always fascinated me. And uh, I'm excited to get a chance to spend a little time thinking about it with you today. Uh, and I think this particular topic is always important, but uh, I feel like it's becoming more and more important as the, you know, the world we live in just starts to become more and more complex. Um, and my plan for us during the next hour is to spend a little time with some definitions of these terms and their various components and attributes, and also to consider some practices that can help us adopt a more uh, empathetic mindset in general as college instructors. So um, if that sounds good to you, uh, let's get to it. So let's start with emotional intelligence or EI in general. And it can be, <clears throat> excuse me, defined most simply as knowing what one's feelings are and using that knowledge to make good decisions. Um, I, I particularly like that last part of the, the definition, making good decisions. And there are four major domains of emotional intelligence uh, related to how we manage ourselves, how we handle relationships, what we are able to recognize or what we're aware of and how we're able to regulate all of these things. So the first component is self-awareness or the ability to recognize and understand our emotions and our motivations, um, as well as how they impact others. Along this recognition access, next we have social awareness or the ability to understand the needs and emotions of others. So then along this regulation axis, we have self-management or the ability to control our own emotions and impulses in positive ways. And then finally, we have social skills or the ability to build and manage relationships with others. So, I, you know, I think it's pretty obvious here that emotional intelligence is undoubtedly a really complex topic. That, that really deserves much more than a one hour webinar to explore um, really adequately. So today, my goal is for us to focus primarily on this, this social hemisphere um, of these four quadrants and specifically the practice of empathy. So with that in mind, this kind of begs the question, what is empathy? So I wanna turn that over to you all for a minute and ask, how would you all define empathy? What, when you think of it, how do you conceptualize empathy? You can pop it in the chat. You can unmute yourself and say something if you'd like, either one is fine. Putting yourself in another's shoes, absolutely. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Seeing things from another person's viewpoint. Yeah, thanks, Shauna. Yeah. Adam's right, literally an ability to feel with caring. Yes, thank you, Randy. It is very much about caring and feeling with others, like Adam said, sharing feelings or understanding another's feelings. Yeah, exactly. You're all absolutely on the money here. So the definition that I really like um, is another really simple one. And that is this, empathy, is the ability to sense other people's emotions coupled with the ability to imagine what someone else might be thinking or feeling. So everything that um, we've been listing in the chat so far uh, is absolutely right. So this idea of feeling with others, um, being able to imagine what other people are feeling and kind of see it from their respective perspective, 
Um, and Kashif here has a really, I really like um, what he's sharing in the chat here, specifically about teacher empathy, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and this idea of remembering your student life and including all the struggles that you've been through. But yeah, I think that's a great way to look at it. Um, so let, let's look at it um, through the lens of being a teacher. Um, and zoom in even a little bit more here. So we can conceptualize teacher empathy, much like Kashif has listed here for us, um, as the degree to which instructors work to deeply understand students' personal and social situations, feel caring and concern in response to students' positive and negative emotions, and communicate their understanding and caring to students through their behavior. And this um, this definition here touches on um, a lot of the major attributes that we're going to be focusing on here uh, during this webinar. So there's a great deal of research, so much research, that supports the importance of empathy and EI for instructors and the teaching and learning process in general. And in fact, there is a neural connection between the thinking and emotional centers of the brain. And that connection can serve to either enhance or conversely inhibit a person's ability to learn. So um, when we're dealing with emotions positively, they can activate or stimulate the brain, um, encourage better storage and better recall of information. Or on the flip side, uh, negative emotions and stress can in fact kind of hijack um, cognition, reduce the opportunity for neuron growth, and pretty much just get in the way of learning. So when our um, emotional resources are being stressed and they're focused on some negative emotion, um, all of our energy goes towards that and we have less bandwidth left over to focus on the learning process. So being aware of the emotions that are happening in our classroom and responding with empathy um, are really important for us as teachers. So in kind of a nutshell, here are the things that the literature tells us about empathic teaching. So first of all, it fosters better teacher-student relationships. This is probably not surprising, right? Um, it creates a more positive and effective learning environment based on these things that we just talked about. Uh, it also facilitates more motivated learning from our students. When students know that we care, they're going to care more uh, about what they're doing. Um, empathy is also positively correlated with improved student performance, as well as reduced student incivility, which I think is really interesting. Um, it also is positively correlated with reduced stress for both students and teachers alike, which you may find interesting, as well as uh, perceptions of higher teaching efficacy, again, by both students and teachers as well. So, you know, as you can see here, there are a lot of really good reasons to practice empathy in our classrooms. Uh, so I am assuming the reason you're all here today is to think about how exactly can we do that? What are some ways that we can be more empathetic teachers? So let's shift to that then um, and consider the ways that we might cultivate an overall empathy mindset, um, as well as teaching practices that can help us demonstrate empathy in meaningful, effective, and reasonable ways. Okay, so I'm going to focus on four essential attributes of empathy here perspective taking, setting aside judgment, understanding emotions, and communicating that understanding to our students. Okay, so let's start with perspective taking. Uh, that's where we started when we started thinking about the general definition of empathy, right? And it's in the title of the session, putting ourselves in our students' shoes. Being purposeful, about considering other people's viewpoints. And in this case, the perspectives and situations of our students. So to nurture this attribute, you want to adopt the, adopt the mindset of identifying possible non-pejorative reasons for undesirable student behaviors. 
So in other words, those moments when you feel frustrated with a student, uh, when they don't turn in an assignment um, or participate in class or don't perform the way you want them to, um, we want to purposefully work to consider some reasons that might that these behaviors might be happening other than uh, these students, they're just lazy, they're forgetful, they don't care, um, they're entitled and don't care about their education, right? Those, those, um, those reasons probably come really easily to us. So we have to work to think about some other possible reasons. So just off the top of your head, um, we're just gonna spitball it here. What are some possible non-pejorative reasons a student might not say, uh, turn in an assignment? What are some reasons besides they're lazy or forgetful or entitled? Working too many hours, that yeah, feels like a failure. Health problems, absolutely. Working 40 plus hours a week. Time management, yep. Family problems, absolutely. There are all different kinds of things that could be at play in our students' lives. Emotional distress, mental health challenges. Yet yeah, there's a lot of research that shows us that um, our students, I mean, everybody in general, but specifically our, our students are struggling with mental health right now um, during, and, and I, I hesitate to say after COVID because we're still in it, but um, th that's a real concern, right? Um, so physical health, mental health, um, all of these things that we don't necessarily know that's going on in our students' lives. So we want to try to remember that there are other reasons besides just those really negative ones that might pop into our head. So along with a lot of the things that you've been mentioning here, right, they might have a lot of extracurricular responsibilities that we don't know about. Could be work, it could be childcare. Um, we know that our students likely have a lot of other things on their plate that they're juggling. Um, there's one study that shows that uh, up to 80% of undergraduates work, 40% of them work at least 30 hours a week. 25% um, of undergraduates have dependent children that they're caring for. Uh, and these numbers might be even higher for some of our students here at Collin. Um, they might also struggle with a fear of failure or a lack of self-efficacy, which was also mentioned in the chat. Um, they might be worried that they're not gonna succeed. Um, so they don't do it at all. That can be really paralyzing, right? There are lots of other things we might consider as well. Um, stereotype threat, for instance, students of color um, or other students might struggle with this fear of confirming a negative stereotype about a, some uh, identifying group that they're in. And that has been shown to uh, very much interfere with student performance. Um, similarly, many students, such as first generation college students, um, might also struggle with belonging uncertainty, which occurs when people feel like they're not valued, they're not respected, they're not included, or feel that, again, maybe feel like they don't belong there and they're not sure how they fit in. So these are just a few things you guys already um, identified a lot of other kinds of uh, what we're calling non-pejorative reasons for uh, student behavior. So practices, what are some practices that can help us with perspective taking? Um, first, obviously, we want to work really hard to recognize the social and or personal context of our students uh, in which they're gonna be operating. So what about their lives? Uh, their cultures, their experiences, um, or individual situations might be impacting how they're operating in our class. So again, it could be big systemic concerns. It could be small individual concerns like a family emergency. Um, but keeping those things in mind and, and staying in communication with students can help us with that. It can also be really beneficial to work to identify commonalities with and amongst your students, to build feelings of community, to build feelings of belonging for our students, and to help foster that feeling of connection with them. 
um, you know, if, if you as a teacher can identify with a student in some way, whether it's thinking back to that time that you were a student and you struggled with something, um, or even just finding a common interest, uh, then it'll, it'll ultimately be easier to consider their perspective and keep that in mind rather than thinking, them, thinking of them as this um, one more student in the list, right? They become an individual. You also want to make it a habit to invite multiple perspectives during class. This might be during class discussions, when you're considering readings um, or other course content, um, what have you. By welcoming diverse perspectives, you can not only remind yourself that you need to consider those diverse perspectives, but also you're encouraging your students to develop this habit as well, which is a really positive thing um, in terms of helping them develop better critical thinking skills, as well as developing their own empathy. Um, inviting multiple perspectives also creates space for many voices in the classroom, as well as more inclusivity and again, feelings of belonging in the classroom. When students feel like they have a voice and their perspectives matter, then uh, they're all going to feel more comfortable and more welcome in the classroom and more heard. So let's take a minute to practice this skill. So I have here on this chart a few pretty typical negative characterizations instructors might assign to students who exhibit some kind of undesirable behavior. So what I want us to do is kind of put up, take on that empathy mindset, put on our empathy glasses, and see if we can come up with some alternate perspectives. So let's use this first one just as an example. So maybe we have a student who has cheated um, or plagiarized something in our class. Uh, so instead of simply seeing that as manipulation, right, which is an easy perspective to take, perhaps we might think about it and see this as a student seeing, uh, doing what he felt was needed to survive, right? Um, maybe the student didn't feel like he could succeed otherwise. Maybe he was feeling a lot of pressure, um, maybe has a high expectations to live up to at home and, and wasn't feeling particularly confident. And this is the only solution that he could say. P.S. I'm not saying that cheating is right or wrong, but this is just a way to practice taking on this mindset. Okay, so does what I'm asking make sense here? Anybody have any questions? We're doing okay? Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. So let's start with this first one, laziness. So that surface level behavior we might perceive as laziness. What might be an empathy mindset perspective of this particular um, attribute? What are some reasons for something that we might perceive as laziness? you're being wrong. Yep. Not turning in finished work. That's right. Maybe they did, couldn't get it done. They didn't know how to do it. So they were scared to turn it in. Stayed up late. Yep. <laughs> For sure. Anxiety. Yep. Time management, feeling overwhelmed. No answers to questions. Yep. Extremely lazy, but she had a 3.9 GPA. That sounds nice. Yeah, depression, absolutely. Thank you, Monica. Depression can absolutely change the way we're able to operate um, and what we're able to accomplish. Yeah, missing class for some reason. Um, that might be a really good reason we don't know about. Uh, Carol, that's a great one too. It's Saturday, there's no professor to contact for help. That's a really great suggestion. So yeah, you guys got it. So maybe the student's overwhelmed by other responsibilities. Maybe they are unable to make decisions. They can't stay organized, lack of confidence. And again, the things that I have here on this chart, there's no right or wrong answer to these. These are just some possibilities. So let's look at another one. What about a behavior that we perceive as resistance from a student? I'm sure we've all had students like that before. Not always easy. I know I struggle with that myself when I'm in the classroom. 
So what are some possibilities for resistance? So maybe what I mean by resistance is say, a student who's refusing to participate in an activity you've given them in class, or um, they are not, maybe they're not communicating with you in a respectful way. They're asking questions again that that may not be respectful, or you or you might perceive as um, pushing back against something that you've said in the classroom. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, maybe they don't understand the assignment. They're not confident in their response <laughs> for sure. Don't feel comfortable interacting. Yes, absolutely. Cannot accept failure. Yes, for sure. I think that's a big one. Yeah, there. I think there are a lot of things that we might not consider when it comes to resistance. You know, maybe we have a student who has a lot of mistrust. Um, maybe they've been hurt in the past. Maybe they're scared to take a risk. They don't want to be embarrassed. They don't want to be hurt. Um, you know, this, this makes me think of a student I had when I was first starting out um, teaching in college. And uh, it was a student who was the, the very definition of resistance. He didn't want to turn things in. He didn't want to participate in class. He didn't want to answer questions. Um, you know, and I was barely older than he was at the time, you know, in my in my early 20s, just starting out in grad school. And I finally had a conversation with him and realized that fear of failure is what was sparking his resistance. This was his third time to take the class. He had failed it twice before. He had basically convinced himself that he was going to fail again. So why bother? Why, why um, willingly you know, what he perceived to be as look stupid um, in class by trying when he knew that he wasn't going to do well anyway. So that was a big eye opener for me. And I think a really great example of being open to other reasons. So let's do one more. Let's skip down to um, seeking attention. Say you have a student who likes to dominate class discussions. Um, who likes to, you know, maybe he's the class clown, uh, likes to crack jokes, generally just kind of um, thrives on positive or negative attention that might come his or her way during class. What are some potential empathy mindset reasons for that kind of behavior? Yeah, lack of self-awareness, for sure. Especially if we have younger students, right? Their brains are still developing at that point. Other ideas? Yeah, they want to feel important. They want to let the teacher know they are trying. I like that one, Carol. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie, it's another good one. No one else is answering. They feel like they have to. Yeah, I've had a student like that before too, Nandini. <laughs> Sweet, but doesn't know when to stop. Yeah, these, these students can be tricky too because they don't, they don't necessarily mean, um, they don't have ill will. They may not know, realize what they're doing, um, but can be disruptive to class sometimes. So, you know, maybe we have a student who feels alone, who feels unheard, just looking for connection, looking for, um, attention, whether positive or negative, um, to feel like they belong. Maybe they feel like they're they're helping the class in some way. Maybe they just have um, the energy of an extrovert that is difficult to control. Right? There's a, there's a lot of good reasons for this. So, any questions at this moment in time? Is, is everything making sense so far? I feel okay to uh, keep moving forward. High energy when answering questions. Yeah. Yeah, Mandini, that's a great point. Sometimes acknowledging the effort can help. I totally agree. Um, I once um, had a student who was like this, maybe not negative attention, but very much kind of like a, the first to answer the conversation dominator. 
and I had a, um, a conversation with him during an individual conference and he was actually very aware that he was doing it, but he was doing that because he kind of felt bad when nobody would respond right away to questions that I asked. Um, which was really helpful. And I you know, was able to have a conversation with him by saying, hey, look, thank you so much. Um, I can tell you're really bright. You've got a lot of great um, ideas um, and I know you're with me, but I need to hear from some of the other students in class too sometimes. So maybe we could have a signal like when I need your help or when I need you to wait a minute before you respond. Um, he was really open to that and it went really well. All right, I just say it in class. I, I'll just say like, you know, for, I mean, so this is not the student's name, let's call him Jack. So I will say, hey, yeah. so, oh, so, okay, so Jack read the chapter, who else did? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. Yeah, I, and I love doing things like, um, okay, I've heard from this side of the classroom a lot today. I wanna hear from somebody on this side right now or somebody from the back row. Um, and that's a way also to do it without, um, highlighting that individual student again in good ways or bad ways but you know sometimes appealing to their ego can help that's for sure all right so setting aside judgment this is the next attribute of empathy um this can be a really hard one sometimes i think um you know we're academics we've all been trained in the, the art of uh, critical analysis and um, evaluating and assessment and all of these things. So in order to adopt this mindset, one thing we really need to do is get comfortable with interrogating uh, and setting aside our own biases, any assumptions that we might make um, about our students and any emotions that we might have, um, because you know we're bringing emotions into the classroom too. So we need to make it a habit to ask ourselves, what else do I need to know to understand better, right? What, what might I be missing? Um, so again, I'm gonna turn to you guys. What are some biases or assumptions that we might have about our students? Good or bad? Any thoughts? Yeah, that they're less prepared for college. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, poor high school preparation. And so this is often the case, but not always the case, right? I'll sometimes ask the students because I have a student information sheet that I pass out on the first mm -hmm. day of class. Love and that. Because we're, we're a speech class and sometimes I have, not sometimes, but I always have, you know, some students who have communication apprehension and mm -hmm. they are taking the class because they have to, but they are petrified of giving presentations or speaking mm -hmm. up in class. So mm -hmm. I, I do have a sheet that I pass out and I will ask them, you know, what do I need to know about you as we get ready to work together? in yeah. the next six weeks. What yeah. can I, what would help me help you better? Mm -hmm. You know, things like that. Yeah, so that's I love, yeah, I love that. And um, we're actually gonna talk about that a little bit later. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, we have some other really good assumptions showing up in the chat here, you know, assuming that our students aren't working hard, that they're not doing the reading or other things that we've asked them to do, that they just want the easy way out. Yeah. Um, you know, we might even think about the flip side of the coin, which is we assume that they already know some of the foundational knowledge that we want them to have when they get to our class. Um, and then we feel frustrated when they don't have it, right? Um, which is, you know, again, kind of the flip side of that underprepared coin, that they're bored, yeah. Or that they're, you know, maybe they're not interested in, their education or they don't really care about it. Um, you know, there are all kinds of assumptions and biases that we might bring with us into the classroom. So again, this is a hard one, but just by be, trying to be aware of these things that we're bringing with us, that can help us work to set aside our judgment when we're um, working with our students. 
So a few practices that we can employ here. Uh, first of all, I think Stephanie mentioned this in the chat, demonstrating active listening. So we need to give our full attention and listen to both a student's words and their tone of voice when they're, when they're talking with us, whether it's in class or in an individual meeting. We need to really listen rather than waiting to speak. Uh, and there's a difference. And we don't wanna just jump in to tell students how they're wrong. Again, that can be hard to resist sometimes, but we need to be willing to sit back and let, and let them, again, have a voice and say their piece and really actively listen to them and pay attention to them. Um, I, you know, I can think of some family members uh, of my own who could probably use a lesson in active listening. Uh, another good practice is to work to use I statements uh, to avoid placing blame when you're communicating with students. So a you statement might be something like, um, you disrupted class today. Uh, that can put a student on the defensive, right? Even, you know, even if it's true, even if they did disrupt class. So if you can turn it into an I statement by focusing on your feelings, your perception, you know, maybe you say something like, so I observed that other students seem to be disrupted by your uh, behavior in class today. Uh, this can helpfully create a more positive space for more productive conversation rather than just finger pointing. Now, if you've been to any of my other sessions, uh, I know that you have definitely heard me talk about this one before, uh, and that is demonstrating transparency with your students. Uh, transparency about your expectations, about your rationale for your, whether it's your course policies, um, for an assignment that you're giving them, class activities, you name it. All of the, this transparency in any form can ameliorate a multitude of potential conflicts in the classroom. Um, basically by letting students uh, <laughs> in on the secret. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because Patrick says, I love, I love uh, rubrics. Yes, I do. I love rubrics and you're gonna learn that about me if you don't already know that. But you know what, Patrick, I'm not talking about rubrics today. But right now I wanna focus on my passion for transparency. So um, when you're being transparent, you're kind of letting students see the method behind your madness, so to speak. So in terms of setting aside judgment, what this means is that you as the instructor, you need to feel comfortable recognizing that, you know, we're not always perfect. We may not always be the clearest communicator. Um, our students might not always fully understand what we're trying to do in the classroom with a particular strategy or a particular activity. And we might need to work a little bit harder to connect the dots for them in order to facilitate the learning process. So being transparent does not mean dumbing things down, okay, for students who are too, too unprepared or who we think are incapable, right? It simply means creating a path to success for all and giving them the directions that they need to get there. And then finally here, we also want to create a safe environment for mistake making in the classroom um, where they can try without suffering big consequences or embarrassment if they get something wrong. Um, you know, if they give a wrong answer, for instance, when you ask a question during class, thank them for their participation, um, find what I like to call the kernel of rightness uh, in their response, and then help them and the rest of the class find their way to the right answer, as opposed to just shutting them down and maybe making them regret having um, participated. Um, give them low stakes or no stakes activities or assignments um, during class that can help them practice applying knowledge before they have to do it in a higher stakes way, like for um, a major grade or for an exam or something like that. There are, again, all different kinds of ways. Um, but again, create this, this feeling of safety around making mistakes and that, you know, help them realize it's a learning process. 
And then, of course, tell them why you're doing that, right? Because that's the transparency piece. All right. So the third attribute of empathy is perhaps the most obvious, and that is understanding and validating student feelings. So this was another big piece of what we talked about when we were discussing the, the kind of the basic definition of empathy earlier. So to adopt this mindset, essentially, we just need to acknowledge the fact that people are inherently emotional beings, right? And that includes us as well as our students. So again, remember what, what we discussed earlier in the session about the neural connections between emotions and cognition. So as instructors, we can help our students get into better brain states for learning just by acknowledging their hopes, their worries, their own expectations for the course. This will positively affect how they feel, uh, reduce stress or feelings of worry, feelings of threat, et cetera, and then kind of clear the way for that cognition that stress and emotion might have been hijacking at the moment. So what are some ways that we can work to understand our students' emotions? Something that Nandini already brought up with us, and that is um, giving some anonymous student surveys or maybe non-anonymous questionnaires at the beginning of the semester. Um, you know, Nandini mentioned asking her students some questions, giving them um, a worksheet to fill out. This is something I really like to do too. Um, ask them questions at the beginning of the semester that they can um, provide me with information about themselves on. Um, I really like to ask uh, a question, you know, like, what else would you like me to know about you um, this semester? Or what else do you think would be helpful for me to know as your teacher? Uh, students can obviously choose to respond or not to any or any of these questions, but honestly, you'd be really surprised about some of the things that they might choose to share with you um, and reveal in these kinds of things. And then similarly, you can implement individual or class check-ins. Um, this could be something as quick and easy as you know, what we did at the start of the session really briefly, where I asked you to communicate how you were feeling today in a really abstract way. In this case, I was asking you to share, you know, what's your weather today? Um, you can also ask them to be really direct about it. You know, how's there, you know, how are you feeling today? Or what's something um, that you're worried about today or stressed out about today? Or what are you feeling really good about? Um, again, a lot of different strategies for doing this. Um, I am a big proponent of scheduling one-on-one -on -one meetings with students. In fact, Jay is even mentioning that in the, the chat right now. Yeah, students absolutely um, can will open up more in one-on-one -on -one meetings, some more than others. Um, this is something that I love to do. You could think about doing it throughout the semester. Um, this will depend, of course, on the number of students you have. I know some of you have a whole lot of students. Um, but these could even just be like 15, 10, 15 minute conversations that you have with them. Um, you know, obviously it can be time consuming, again, depending on the number of students you have, but it can be very, very illuminating. Um, and as Jay suggests here, students feel more comfortable opening up with you in that particular setting. And it gives you a chance to really get to know them in a, in a different and more personal way. Um, you know, if I hadn't done this in one of my classes, I would never have learned about a student of mine whose father was battling cancer. And the student then decided to turn down a basketball scholarship to an out of state college um, just to be closer to his father, which I, I thought was really amazing. Um, and it told me a lot about this student. And um, this was a very, very shy student, didn't talk much during class, very introverted. But him opening up to me in that way allowed us to kind of forge a connection um, that made him feel more comfortable opening up to me in other ways when he needed to. Another idea that I like, I have not tried this before. Um, so it, you know, I can't speak to whether it's, it's worked for me, but uh, I really like this idea of a class mailbox. Um, you know, which entails setting up kind of a comment box for students 
where they can leave notes uh, if they want to communicate a struggle that they're having, um, something that's on their mind, a question that they might have. Um, it could be anonymous, it could be non-anonymous. Um, a different way that you could do this is, uh, might be more familiar to you. Um, you could do this through exit tickets that students do at the end of a, end of a class. You could do this periodically. Um, sometimes, you know, I've used it in the sense of uh, kind of a muddiest point where I ask them at the end of a class, okay, write down what um, is still unclear to you from this, from today's lesson, what questions you still have. But you could use that same kind of activity in different ways um, as a way to check in with students uh, in terms of their emotions, their feelings, their struggles, whatever the case might be. And then finally, it is always important to pay attention to our students' nonverbal cues during class when you can. So this means watching their facial expressions, their body language. Um, are they dressing differently? Uh, do they, uh, are they interacting with you differently? Do they have uh, a different tone? Are they, is their posture different in class? And I know that this might be a little different, a little more difficult in an online classroom setting, but there are still nonverbal cues present in that classroom as well. So for instance, maybe you can't see your students' faces to know if they're with you or not, right? Um, but perhaps you could look out for other nonverbal cues like different patterns of communication that they might be showing. So maybe it's a student who um, is very participatory in the chat during an online synchronous class, but now they're not. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that, that you can go about this. Staying in tune with our students, uh, what they're telling us without actually telling us, right, uh, can help us stay in touch with their feelings and things that might be influencing them, or at least get a sense of, of where they are, even if they don't want to come right out and say it. And that's often the case, right? So let's practice this too. So there was a recent study published in Nature, very recent, like a few weeks ago, that found that there are 16 facial expressions that are most common to emotional situations globally, regardless of culture um, or language or anything like that. And I, again, I think this is super fascinating. So here on this slide, are representations of those 16 identified universal facial expressions um, as created by one of the authors of this particular study, along with the 16 emotions that they identified. So take a minute, look at the faces, and then we'll see if we can match the expressions with the emotions. We're gonna our, test our ability to read facial emotions. Okay, so what does number one look like to you? Concern, puzzled, yep. Actually, Carol's right, it is confusion. Oops. Okay, how about number two? Any ideas? So remember, it's gonna be one of the emotions that are listed here on the slide, A through P. Yep, you're all good. Okay, so number two is um, desire, apparently. Um, Number three. Yep, it's um, it's pain. Yeah, I know I numbered it up and down. I have a reason for it, but I'm not going to tell you why. I'll tell you in a minute. Okay, how about number four. Yep, it's amusement. 
That one's a little bit easier, I think. Some of these are hard. Um, okay, number five, up there in the top row. I, I think this one's kind of hard. Yeah, it's contempt, it's F. Okay, six. Yep, it's doubt. Okay, seven. Yep, seven is sadness. And number eight. Yep, absolutely, Stephanie, it's anger, B. Number nine, back in the top row. I think this one's tricky too, for what it's worth. Yeah, this one's contentment, G. Okay, 10. Yep, you got it, Stephanie. It's elation. Um, how are we doing on time? We're doing okay. Um, 11. Yep, 11 is, oh, surprise. Good job. 12. I think this one's tricky too. Yeah, this one is um, supposed to be awe. C. Um, okay, where are we? 13, up in the top row again. Yes, 13, 13 is disappointment, I. So I think disappointment and sadness um, overlap for me a little bit. Uh, number 14, so we're on the second row, last column. 14 is apparently interest, but Stephanie, I kind of agree with you too. To me, this the um, interest and desire can look a little similar. Um, 15. Yep, Monica, you got it right, triumph. And then 16. We have only one left. And that is concentration. So um, I, I'll be saving um posting these slides on my website along with the recording of this so if you want to revisit this um you'll be able to access it on on my website so it's kind of interesting huh i thought so yeah so p.s the <laughs> the way the reason that i numbered it up and down is because i was trying to mix up um the facial expressions, the original photo was a grid and I was cutting it up and moving things around and I didn't want it to all be in alphabetical order because y'all are smart and y'all would figure that out right away. So that's why it, this weird uh, numbering down as in, instead of across. So sorry for that. Okay, so let's look ahead then to the final attribute here of empathy, which is communicating understanding, which basically just means letting your students know that you recognize and respect their feelings and perspective. So to take on this mindset, it's important to acknowledge that people need to feel heard, not necessarily fixed, right? This one, um, I will confess, can be hard for me because I am a fixer. Um, someone comes to me uh, to express something they're worried about and I want to fix it right away. This is not always the right response. Sometimes people just want to feel heard. 
So how can we communicate this understanding? One strategy is to be purposeful about creating what's called a warm syllabus that establishes rapport between you and your students while also communicating course expectations. So a warm syllabus is going to do things like use personal pronouns, use inclusive language, uh, avoid confrontation and condescending language or tone, um, conveys openness and availability to students, and, and focuses on information and tools that you as the teacher can provide to your students to promote their learning and help them succeed rather than just describing, okay, here's what we're going to cover, here's when stuff is due, okay? So a little more than just the basic contract that we give students at the beginning of the semester, because that will help communicate to them that you care about their success in the class and that you're here to help them and make you feel, make you be more approachable to them. Uh, you might also consider your late work, your resubmission policies, uh, and giving students opportunities for a second chance if they have a bad day. Um, that could be things like flexible due dates for assignments. It could be a revise and resubmit policy. Um, it could be an opportunity to correct mistakes on an exam. It could be dropping the lowest grade or, or even giving students a set number of tokens that allows them to redo assignments um, or make up for a class absence, submit late work. Again, there are a lot of different strategies to do this. I talked about some of these in a previous webinar. Um, I think it was the uh, uncertainty webinar that I did recently. Um, but again, thinking about ways you can incorporate flexibility and give um, second chances to students can be beneficial. Um, again, it doesn't mean not holding them accountable for things, but just relaxing on some rigidity sometimes. Yeah, Joni, I love that idea. Joni writes that she used to allow um, one no questions asked psych day as long as it wasn't on a due date or exam day. Love that idea. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a great a great strategy. Um, another thing to consider is that you can provide opportunities to you know kind of increase students' mental bandwidth by doing things like scaffolding their learning, breaking difficult content or big projects into smaller components that are spaced out, right? So it makes it easier for them to really do the assignment right, um, as well as providing formative feedback to them along the way, rather than after they've already turned something in to help them course correct before it's too late. And then lastly, work to provide your students with a sense of progress to sustain their motivation, um, to maintain persistence, you know, point out things they're doing well along the way and provide them with lots of small wins to keep them going. This could even be something as simple as, you know, saying, you know, hey, Lori, thank you so much for that comment you made today in class. That was really thoughtful. Or even to the whole class, you know, like, great job today, guys. That was a great discussion that we had. Thank you so much. Um, again, giving them that positive feedback um, and they, when they're not expecting it can be really beneficial. Um, so, we've talked about attributes of empathy, good empathetic practices in the classroom, um, but obviously responding with empathy is not always going to be a piece of cake. Um, but the good news is, is that it can absolutely be learned, right? Um, there are, however, some responses that can get in the way of empathy um, and instead feel deflating or frustrating to the person to whom they're directed. So these, um, which I've heard called empathy busters, uh, there are a few of them here, but these are some things to look out for. Advising or saying something like, you know what, I think you should do this. Giving them unsolicited advice. Um, similar to educating or saying something like, you know, you could turn this into a positive experience if you just did this instead. One upping. This might be one of my biggest pet peeves. And that is saying, 
um, you know, oh yeah, well, at least this didn't happen to you or that's nothing. Let me tell you about my experience, right? That, that comp competitive response, not functional. Um, storytelling, uh, which would be saying something like, you know what, that reminds me of something that I heard about or um, I have a family member who loves to say, you know what, I saw something on Facebook about that. That drives me bonkers. Uh, shutting down, which would be doing something like telling someone, you know, oh, cheer up um, or uh, don't feel bad about that. That's no big deal. You're shutting down their emotions by saying that. Data gathering or saying something like, so now when did all of this start? How did this happen? Instead of just hearing, listening to them, that active listening that we talked about. Correcting, this is really not effective. Um, saying, you know, that is not what happened. Let me tell you what actually happened. Uh, we have denial of feelings, which I think is similar to shutting down, where you say something like, you don't need to worry about that. That's not a big deal. Minimizing similarly, you know, that doesn't matter. Don't, whatever. That's not important. And then diagnosing or analyzing, which might be saying something like, you know what your problem is? You're too much like this. Or I think this has to do with that. So, you know, trying to diagnose your student or your friend. So be on the lookout for these. Um, if you find yourself responding um, with one of these tactics, just try to be aware of it. Try to disrupt that impulse um, and go back to that active listening process that we talked about already. Um, so just a couple of more thoughts here. It might feel like being empathetic means that you have to lower standards for your students um, or make things too easy for them so that you're reducing stress. Um, but this is not the case, okay? Teaching with empathy means considering what students need to be successful after they graduate, which means keeping student le learning at the center to ensure that they really are well prepared after they leave your class. So empathy then means removing obstacles to learning, not lowering standards, um, not avoiding holding students accountable for things, okay? It does not mean that there's no discipline in the classroom or that there's no accountability. And then one more thing I really wanna make sure that you keep in mind here. Be sure to set some healthy boundaries for yourself to protect yourself from becoming overwhelmed, from becoming burned out, from experiencing compassion fatigue. Um, teaching with empathy does not mean that we have to be our students' therapists. Um, in fact, we should not, we absolutely should not be our students' therapists. It's not our job. We are not trained to do this. Um, so we really need to be mindful of drawing and maintaining those boundaries to protect both ourselves as well of, as well as our students. Okay, we can be an empathetic teacher and practice empathy without being on call 24 seven for our students. That's not what we're talking about today. So as we wrap up, I hope that you've been thinking about your own teaching practices, your own responses and how they align with some of the things we've discussed today. Um, any thoughts, kind of final reflections here about things you might want to try to change in your teaching or some new practices you wanna to try to demonstrate more empathy in the classroom? Ooh, there's a typo there. I'm so embarrassed. In your classroom, not you classroom. Thanks, Jay. Well, I hope that you will continue to think about these things. Um, if you have any questions um, or want to discuss anything further, I hope that you will reach out to me. I'm happy to talk about these things more. Like I said, this is something that's really um, an interest of mine. And um, I think this is a great practice for all, all of us to really think more about and work on incorporating. Um, and just a reminder, we still have a few more fall events left. 
in terms of our teaching and learning webinars and one more roundtable discussion. So um, thank you so much for being here today. If you have any questions, please let me know and um, have a great rest of your day. I hope you have good weather.